Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 21st, 2021, and we are officially into spring. Uh, the growing equinox arrived on Saturday, March 20th. Okay, so that marks the first day of spring. So I hope everybody's doing well uh, today. We have a jam-packed show. A lot to cover. Um, I want to deal with this uh, topic here. I saw this story back February 21st, 2021. And this ties into the whole fight for reparations and arguments for reparations, etc. And this is a piece, uh, this is a little known piece of uh, African American history. I, I saw an article dealing with uh, Henrietta Wood, and I, I also heard a, a segment on the radio show uh, about Henrietta Wood. And uh, Henrietta Wood was a former slave who sued her former master for reparations in 1870. She sued her former master for reparations in 1870. Now, you know that chattel slavery ends basically in 1865. The Civil War ends officially June 1865. Then you have the 13th Amendment of uh, ratified December 1865. Okay, so this is 1870. And she's going to sue for reparations of $20,000. And um, we're going to deal with that story and let you know what happened with that. Then today is uh, March 21st. It's the 56th anniversary of the beginning of the Selma to Montgomery March. Uh, Dr. King begins the Selma to Montgomery March fighting for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We know this is also, early this month, we commemorated the 56th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965. So the Selma to Montgomery March was preceded by two weeks by Bloody Sunday. We'll talk a little bit about the Selma to Montgomery March. Now, at the very same time that we're commemorating the Selma to Montgomery March, you have Republicans in 43 state legislatures trying to ram through 253 bills to, to increase voting restrictions and reduce who can vote. Ground zero for this is in the state of Georgia, the great state of Georgia, former Confederate state. Reverend Raphael Warnock this past week delivered his first uh floor address to the U.S. Senate, and he championed federal voting laws to blunt Georgia's proposed restrictions. We're going to talk some about this because all this is connected. Now, some of the very same people, some of the very same people who were teary-eyed when John Lewis passed away, okay, last year, and had great things to say about John Lewis, some of the very same people, Republicans, some of the very same people who uh, will put out lukewarm statements about Dr. King on Dr. King Day, okay, and how he was a great man. They'll work the rest of the year to dismantle Dr. King's legacy and dismantle uh, John Lewis, uh, John Lewis's legacy as well. So we'll talk some about that. Republicans, Republicans rally behind voting restriction bills in 43 states. Republicans rally behind voter restriction bills in 43 states. Okay, uh, and we'll, do, we'll deal with all that and some more today on the African History Network show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here 
on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, uh, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Sign up for our email newsletter there as well. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We're here six days a week. That helps us to keep um, doing the research, keep broadcasting, stay on the air, etc. Uh, I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on uh, Friday, so we had a good show Friday. Um, what I'll do is uh, on Monday's show, we'll share uh, another segment of uh, me being on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I'm a panelist on uh, every Friday. We're going to share another segment today, but it's going to be jam-packed. I don't think we're going to have time to do that. Okay, so let's jump into this. I, I want to deal with the story of uh, Henrietta Wood, and then I'm going to tie this. You know, back on... Uh, Back on my March 7th show, and I fell behind in editing these shows, um, but I'm working on editing the March 7th show right now. Um, I dealt with the uh, city of Evanston, Illinois, and the city of Evanston, Illinois is dealing with grappling with reparations, and they are allocating, uh, they have a $10 million fund to allocate reparations, $25,000 um, allotments to people who want to buy homes basically african americans who want to buy homes and this is uh dealing with reparations for redlining victims of redlining okay which is a very good strategy because all the people who uh survived slavery are dead so they still have people who were victimized by redlining first-hand accounts so it, it makes sense to do that um and also, there was a there was another story from um, uh, there's another story from NBC News. I'm going to try to pull up to tie this all together because this ties into reparations as well. But when we look at uh, Henrietta Wood, there's an article uh, one from uh, Smithsonian, one from um, Washington Post. There was an article I saw from the Washington Post from February 24th. 2021 and when it came out i saved it i did not get a chance to talk about it on the show she used her enslaver for reparations she used her enslaver for reparations her her descendants never knew and this is the story of henrietta wood and then i i saw one from smithsonianmag.com smithsonian institute um in 1870 wood henrietta wood sued for reparations in 1870, Henrietta Wood sued for reparations, okay? And she sued for $20,000. Here's the story of what happened, okay? Now, this article is written by uh, W. Caleb McDaniel, and W. Caleb McDaniel also has a uh, new book out about Henrietta Wood. This is a little known uh, piece of history. So, uh, if we go back to 1878, 1878, on April 17th, 1878, 12 white jurors centered a, entered a federal courtroom in Cincinnati, Ohio, to deliver the verdict in a now forgotten lawsuit about American slavery. Now, the plaintiff's name was Henrietta Wood, and a reporter described um henrietta wood at the time as a speckled negro woman a speckled uh, a spectacled a spectacled negro woman she wore glasses apparently 60 years old now the defendant was zebulon ward z-e-b-u-l-o-n zebulon ward okay and uh zebulon ward ward was a white man who had enslaved henrietta wood 25 years prior 25 years prior and she was suing him for 
uh, $20,000 in reparations. Okay. Now, $20,000 um, reparations back in 1878, um, that's, the, uh, that's the equivalent to somewhere around $600,000 today. Okay. So that's a lot of money back then. Now, two, earlier, two days earlier, the jury had watched as Henrietta Wood took to the witness stand. Her son, Arthur, who lived in Chicago, was in the courtroom. Henrietta Wood was born into slavery in Kentucky, and she testified uh, that she had been granted her freedom in Cincinnati in 1848. But five years later, she was kidnapped by Zebulon Ward, who sold her, and she ended up enslaved on a Texas plantation until after the Civil War. Okay? So she was granted, she says she was granted her freedom in 1848 in Cincinnati, but she was kidnapped, all right, five years later by Zebulon Ward. Now, when you go and study this history, there was a business of going into free territory and capturing African Americans who were free, either set free from slavery or born free, and then taking them into slave territories and selling, selling them into slavery. That happened to Solomon Northrup, who the movie 12 Years of Slave is about. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break and listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. How's everybody doing? Stand by. We're back in just a minute here. Share this broadcast and social media platforms. Advice your friends to tune in also. How you doing, Kim? Thanks for sharing. Chris. Now that's no that's more than twenty five thousand dollars in today's market. Okay, stand by everybody. We'll be back in just a minute here. I had to get ready for this next segment. Oh. Okay, stand by. Okay, we'll be back for breaking just a minute here. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, brother Michael M. Hotel. It is um, Sunday, March 21st, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Okay, so right before the break, we were talking about the story of Henrietta Wood. Um, Henrietta Wood was a former slave who in... 1878 went to court and sued um, to get reparations. All right. So she sued Zebulon Ward, who was a white man who had enslaved her 25 years prior. Now, the um, two years earlier, the jury had watched as Henrietta Wood took the stand. 
Her son, Arthur, lived in Chicago, who lived in Chicago, was in the courtroom. Now, Henrietta Wood said that she was granted her freedom in Cincinnati in 1848, but five years later, she was captured by Zebulon Ward. So that'd be, that would be 1853. So an interesting piece of history here. So 1852, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, publishes, you know, her book is published, her novel is published, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin exposes America to the horrors of slavery. And the, the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, gives steam, to, gives momentum to the abolitionist movement. OK, now this is two years before the uh, Republican Party is going to be founded. Republican Party is founded in 1854 as a direct backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 dealt with leaving it up to uh, inhabitants of Western territory like Kansas and Nebraska, et cetera, to determine whether or not they wanted to have slavery in those territories as opposed to it be dictating be, as opposed to it being dictated by the federal government. And as a backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, you're going to have the Republican Party that's founded, that is uh, founded by uh, abolitionists. And they're going to be the counter to the uh, Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was founded in 1828. A lot of people think the Democratic Party, I hear some people just idiotically saying Democrats created slavery. The, the Democratic Party wasn't founded in 1828. At the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, you, you, didn't, you didn't have political parties then. So you're going to have um, uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's book give momentum to the abolitionist movement. And then we know uh, November 1860, uh, six years after the Republican Party is founded, Abraham Lincoln, who uh, was the presidential candidate for the Republicans, is going to become president-elect. And then six weeks after that, that's November 1860, then six weeks after that, on December 20th, 1860, we know South Carolina, where Senator Spineless Lindsey Graham is from, the, the state he represents, uh, or tries to represent the white people there, some of the white people there in South Carolina. We know South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, becomes the first state to secede from the Union. And then in April of 1861, the Civil War is going to start in South Carolina. Okay. All right. So um, she says she was granted her freedom in Cincinnati in 1848, but five years later, she was kidnapped by Zebulon Ward, who sold her, and she ended up enslaved on a Texas plantation until after the Civil War ended. So we know. June 19th, 1865, General Gordon uh, Granger delivers uh, General Order Number 3 um, in uh, Galveston, Texas. And this is what we, what people celebrate as Juneteenth, okay, letting those enslaved Africans there know that he delivers the Emancipation Proclamation to them, let them know they have, they're free. And this is after the Civil War ended. Uh, now, she finally returned to Cincinnati in 1869, a free woman. She had not forgotten Zebulon Ward and sued him the following year. So 1869 is four years after the Civil War ends. And it's a year after the 14th Amendment of 1868 is ratified also and adopted. But she had not forgotten Zebulon Ward, the man who had kidnapped her and sold her into slavery. So the trial began only after eight years of litigation, leaving Henrietta Wood to wonder if she would ever get justice. Now she watched nervously as the 12 jurors returned to their seats. Finally, they announced a verdict that few had expected. They said, quote, we the jury in the above entitled cause do in the, in the above in the above entitled cause do find for the plaintiff and assess her damages in the premises at two thousand five hundred dollars. So here you have this African American woman who sued for rep reparations. It went through eight years of litigation in eighteen seventy eight. A jury, all white jury, basically. 
found for the plaintiff $2,500. Now, she originally sued for $20,000. Now, though this was a fraction of what Henrietta Wood had asked for, the amount would be worth nearly $65,000 today. It remains that $2,500 that she got, that she was awarded in 1878, that's basically the equivalent to about $65,000 today. Now, it remains the largest known sum ever granted by a U.S. court in restitution for slavery. But Henrietta Woods' name never made it into the history books. When she died in 1912, and that's a year before Harriet Tubman died, and uh, three years before um, Booker T. Washington dies, Booker T. Washington dies in 1915, Harriet Tubman dies in 1913. When Henrietta Wood died in 1912, her lawsuit was already forgotten by all except her son. Today, it remains virtually unknown, even as reparations for slavery are once again in the headlines. Now, she had more sense than a lot of people because she got an attorney and went to court. She was dealing with law. A lot of people, a lot of this stuff didn't reparations, as I said before, as I said on the March 7th broadcast, go back and watch that March 7th broadcast I did. A lot of this stuff didn't reparations. This is not dealing with law. First of all, a president cannot do an executive order for reparations. You, you have to uh, go study Article uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the U.S. Constitution. that clearly tells you Congress controls the power of the purse. That has to pass both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Then be signed in the law by president. Because I hear people saying, oh, the president can do an executive order for reparations. No. No. Can't happen. Not going to happen. Period. Now, you can hallucinate whatever you want to. That's not happening. So, um, so Henrietta Wood won this suit and it was all but forgotten. Today remains virtually unknown as even as reparations for slavery are once again in the headlines. So uh, W. Caleb, uh, w. Caleb McDaniel says he first learned of Henrietta Wood from two interviews that she gave to reporters in the 1870s. He said they led me to archives in nine states in search of her history which, uh, which he tells for the first time in his new book entitled Sweet Taste of, well, this book came out um, a couple of years ago, Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. Henrietta Wood's story began two centuries ago with her birth in Northern Kentucky. And he said, I can't quite tell, uh, she said, I can't quite tell my age, uh, Henrietta Wood recalled in a newspaper interview in 1876, 1876, so 11 years after the Civil War ended. But she knew she was born enslaved to the Towsey family, T-O-U-S-E-Y, the Towsey family between 1818 and 1820. So it was common for a lot of enslaved Africans not to know the exact year that they were born. Oftentimes, as Frederick Douglass explains in his uh, first autobiography, because he wrote three autobiographies, uh, as Frederick Douglass explains, a lot of times they would pinpoint their uh, the month of their birth or the time of the year they were born or something like that. They were pinpointed by the type of crops that were being planted. So cotton planting time, cotton planting time, cherry planting time, tobacco planting time, whatever it was. And he didn't know, Frederick Douglass didn't know the exact year he was born either. He said, he, he said it was either 18, 17, 18, 18, something like that. But here she said, Henrietta Wood said she was born between 1818 and 1820. In 1834, the teenager was bought by a, a Henrietta Wood as a teenager was bought by a merchant in Louisville, Kentucky, and taken from her family. She was soon sold again to a French immigrant named William Sirod, C-I-R-O-D-E, William Sirod, who took her to New Orleans, 
Now, William Surratt returned to France in 1844, abandoning his wife, whose name was Jane, who eventually took Henrietta Wood with her to Ohio, which was a free state. Because once again, when, when we study the history of slavery in this country, various states are abolishing slavery at different times. Um, when at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, five states had already abolished slavery, starting with Vermont, July 2nd, 1777. And they're going, they're either going to abolish slavery altogether or they're going to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade, bringing, this, uh, uh, bringing Africans into the country to enslave them. And then we know um, uh, Pennsylvania, they're going to have the Gradual Abolition Act of Pennsylvania right around, 17, uh, right around 1780. Uh, so you're going to see this taking place in various northern states. And this is, you'll see this um, leading up to the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. So uh, in 1848, Jane Surratt, who was, the, who was the wife of William Surratt, the French immigrant who uh, took Henrietta Wood to uh, New Orleans, Jane Surratt went to a county courthouse and registered Henrietta Wood as a free person. She said, quote, my mistress gave me my freedom, Henrietta Wood later said, quote, and my papers were recorded, end quote. Now, Henrietta Wood spent the next several years performing domestic work around Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio. She would one day recall that period of her life as a quote unquote sweet taste of liberty, a sweet taste of liberty, uh, sweet taste of liberty. Now, all the while, however, there were people conspiring to take her freedom away. William Surratt's daughter and son-in-law, Josephine and Robert White, still lived in Kentucky and disagreed with William Surratt's wife, Jane Surratt's manumission of Henrietta Wood, setting her free. They viewed her, they viewed Henrietta Wood as an inheritance. They viewed her as property that they were going to inherit. Inherit. By the 1850s, the interstate slave trade was booming. And Europeans, white people, saw dollar signs whenever they thought of Henrietta Wood. All they needed was someone to do the dirty work of enslaving her again. So Zebulon Ward was the man to do this. He was a native Kentuckian who had recently moved to Covington, uh, just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. Zebulon Ward became a deputy sheriff in 1853. The white people lived in Covington. Uh, as well, and I'm sorry, the Whites, um, the um, Robert White and his family, they lived in Covington uh, as well. And in the spring of 1853, they convinced Zebulon Ward to pay them $300 for the right to sell Henrietta Wood and pocket the proceeds for himself, provided he could get, provided he could get her. Now she's a free woman. She's registered as free. She has her papers, but they're conspiring to take away her freedom because they think that this African woman is their inheritance. I guess they were too lazy to go out and work for an inheritance like the rest of us got to do. So they want they, they want to take away her freedom. OK, because they think they are entitled to her. So they. The, the, so uh, Robert White and his family lived in Covington, and in the spring of 1853, they convinced Zebulon Ward to pay them $300 for the right to sell Henrietta Wood and pocket the proceeds for himself. Now, you had gangs that worked throughout the antebellum period to capture free black men and women and children and smuggle them into the South under the cover of the Fugitive Slave Law 
1850, which required the return of runaway slaves. The foundation of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 and 1850 is Article 4, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. If you watch the movie Harriet, there's a scene where there's a uh, protest uh, regarding the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. And because this allowed people to go into free territory and capture slaves and bring them back, uh, if I remember correctly, they, it, 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 it would deny them uh, their day in court, things like this. Because of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, this caused more runaway slaves to then go into Canada, okay? Because they they because they weren't safe up north. So uh, you had gangs of, of, of white people who conspired to capture African-American men, women, and children under the cover of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, which required the return of one race slaves. Zebulon Ward began to plot with a group of these notorious quote unquote slave catchers. The gang located Henrietta Woods employer in Cincinnati, a boarding house keeper named Rebecca Boyd, B-O-Y-D, and paid her to join the scheme to capture Henrietta Wood. One Sunday afternoon in April of 1853, Rebecca Boyd tricked Henrietta Wood into taking a carriage ride across the river. And when the carriage finally rolled to a stop outside of Covington, Henrietta uh, Zebulon Ward's men were waiting for Henrietta Wood. It would be 16 years before Henrietta Wood set foot in Ohio again. Now, this was a free woman, and Europeans are conspiring to capture her for profit. I guess they were too lazy to go work for it themselves. I guess they were too lazy to go work for it themselves. Now, Henrietta Wood spent the first nights of her captivity locked inside two roadside inns. Her captor's destination was Lexi Le Lexington, Kentucky, where prices for slaves had risen in tandem with the southern cotton economy. After 1815, as white settlers rushed into the lower Mississippi River Valley, many looked to purchase enslaved Africans to cultivate the region's most profitable crop. Slave traders met the demand by buying slaves in Virginia, Kentucky, and Maryland and selling them in the cotton states. Between 1820 and 1860, nearly one million people were sold down the river. And we know because of the cotton gin uh, invented about 1793 and cottons of the, and, and copies of the cotton gin, which is, are going to make it more profitable to grow and produce cotton. That's going to increase the need for enslaved Africans. But then also the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, when France sells uh, 828,000 square miles of land to the U.S. for about $15 million because France almost goes bankrupt fighting the uh, against the Haitians during the Haitian Revolution. When the U.S. gets this land from France, and France basically stole it from Native Americans and indigenous African people, the U.S. is going to carve out about 15 states out of the land they get from the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase doubles the territory of the U.S. and is going to, uh, because they have more land, they have more fertile land to grow crops and grow cotton, this is going to increase the need for enslaved Africans on this land. Now, they're going to try to keep a balance between free states and states that have slavery, but it's still, the Louisiana Purchase still increased the need for enslaved African people. Now, Henrietta Ward planned to make, I mean, say Zebulon Ward planned to make Henrietta Wood the latest victim of this trade, but she resolved to fight back. Henrietta Wood secret, secretly told her story to a sympathetic innkeeper who followed her to Lexington, Kentucky, where a lawsuit was filed on her behalf, asserting that she was free. Now, Henrietta Wood was never allowed to testify, however, and uh, Zebulon Ward denied her claims. Her official freedom papers 
at a courthouse in Cincinnati have been destroyed in a fire in 1849 and her kidnappers had confiscated her personal copy of her freedom papers, which was common. This is what they did with, if you watch the movie 12 Years a Slave, that's what they did with Solomon Northrup. Solomon Northrup had his free papers on him. He was captured. They took away his freedom papers and sold him into slavery. And he that's is based on a true story. Solomon Northrup wrote a book about it called 12 Years a Slave. And the uh the movie is based upon his his story. So this was a business that white people had of going into free territory, capturing African Americans, taking them into slave territory, and selling them into slave. I guess they were too lazy to work. So Henrietta Woods' official freedom papers were confiscated also. Now the case was eventually dismissed. In the eyes of Kentucky law, Henrietta Wood was still a slave. Now, the freedom lawsuit had prevented Henrietta Wood from selling. I'm, the freedom lawsuit had prevented Zebulon Ward from selling Henrietta Wood for nearly two years. But in 1855, Zebulon Ward took her to a Kentucky slave trading firm that did business in Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi is also where the devil's punch bowl is. We had thousands of African Americans who died in like this, this huge pit after the Civil War ends. Okay, so people in Natchez, Mississippi, they know like trees that bear fruit. They know don't eat those trees because they know it's human fertilizer that's like underneath those trees is Natchez. You research Natchez, Mississippi. So the traders, the slave traders, put Henrietta Wood up for sale at Natchez infamous Forks of the Road slave market. Forks of the Road slave market. Gerard Brandon, one of the largest slaveholders in the South, bought Henrietta Wood and took her to his house. Brandon Hall on the, uh, 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 took her to her house, Brandon Hall on the Natchez Trace, Natchez, Mississippi Trace, Natchez Trace. Quote, Brandon was a very rich man, Henrietta Wood later said. He owned 700 to 800 slaves on several plantations, and he, quote, put me to work at once in the cotton field. I sold the cotton, S-O-W-E-D, S-O-W-E, S-O-W-E-D, I sold the cotton, Hold the cotton, H-O-E-D, hold the cotton, and pick the cotton. I worked under the meanest overseers and got flogged and flogged until I thought I should die. It, see, now, now you have to sit back and ask the question, okay, so you going to go capture somebody free, sell them into slavery, have them go pick cotton because your ass too lazy to do it yourself. You just sit back and you just look at this and, 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 and some of the descendants of some of these same demons that enslaved our people are trying to make it harder for us to vote to pass laws that are beneficial to everybody. Some of these same demons, they, 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 this is why Reverend Raphael Warnock, the, the clip I'm going to play of Reverend Raphael Warnock on the Senate floor. U.S. Senate floor. Reverend Raphael Warnock calls this the new Jim Crow. Jim Crow in suits. This is what it, this is what it is. These are the descendants of some of these same demons who denied us our freedom in 1855, 1860, captured us, took us back into slavery. Today, their descendants are trying to take us back before eight, before 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. Trying to take us back into a quasi-slavery. Now, at some point during those hellish days, she talking, they're talking about today or back then? At some point during those hellish days, Henrietta Wood gave birth to her son, Arthur, whose father is unknown. She was later removed from the cotton fields and put to work in Brandon's house. The Civil War began followed by the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, but Henrietta Woods' ordeal continued. 
On July 1st, 1863, just days before the U.S. Army arrived to free thousands of people around Natchez, Mississippi, uh, Brandon determined to defy emancipation, forced, forced some 300 slaves to march 400 miles to Texas, far beyond the reach of federal soldiers. And when you study Texas, you're going to see that you're going to have, you see, Texas was more removed from the battles of the Civil War. So you're going to have some white slave owners who are going to flee to Texas with their slaves to be to 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 get away from the Union troops so they can keep their slaves. And today, some of their descendants are trying to pass laws in Texas state legislature to restrict voting for African-Americans and Hispanics because the. Uh, demographics of Texas are changing. The demographics of Georgia are changing. And just as the, just as their ancestors were doing everything they could to capture us and take us back into slavery over 100 years ago, their descendants are doing everything they can to legally lock us out of voting because they know we're going to vote, one, their asses out of office, two, we're going to change the laws and they're trying to hold on to power. All of this is connected. But if you don't understand history, you want to you want understanding of this. When you, you've heard me talk numerous times about uh state representative Denmark Groover in, in the, the great state of Georgia. 1963, Denmark Groover, state representative, a staunch segregationist, he's the one that pushed the the um the the statewide runoff election law which requires that any candidate who does not get 50 percent of the vote or more in the statewide election has to then enter into a runoff with the person who got the second second highest amount of votes that it that was specifically designed that law was specifically designed to lock african americans out of statewide political power in the state of Georgia, a former Confederate state. It was specifically engineered to target African-Americans to lock us out of statewide political power. And right now, the Georgia state legislature is trying to do the same thing with uh, House Bill 531 and, S and, and Senate Bill uh, 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 241, I think it is. H House Bill 540, 531 and Senate Bill 241. They're trying to do the same thing that their ancestors tried to do. Three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, Jalen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to clip two of Reverend Raphael Warnock. Give me a favor. Cue it up at the eleven minute mark. Uh, it's in that article. Clip two, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Cue it up at the 11 minute mark. This is Reverend Raphael Warnock on the U.S. Senate floor. This is his first Senate address. And he is um, dealing with the ramp, the, the, the voter suppression laws that Republicans are trying to push through the Georgia state legislature, trying to enslave us politically. And, and it's important to note the state the, the no exception uh the no exception absentee voting law that republicans passed in 2005 in the um republican controlled state legislature in georgia they're trying to change the law now because african americans used the law to beat donald trump in georgia and get two democratic senators elected in georgia OK, Republicans had used that law for 15 years and it was no problem. Then we learned the law and we started using it and we beat the Republicans. Now, all of a sudden, the same law that Republicans have been using for 15 years to get Republicans elected. Now, all of a sudden, they want to change the law and restrict who can vote by absentee ballot. Let, let's go to this clip, Jalen. 
and our prayers are stronger when we pray together. To be sure we've seen these kinds of voter suppression tactics before, they are a part of a long and shameful history in Georgia and throughout our nation, but refusing to be denied. Georgia citizens and citizens across our country bring the heat and the cold and the rain, some standing in line for five hours, six hours, ten hours, just to exercise their constitutional right to vote. Young people, old people, sick people, working people, already underpaid for us to lose weight. to pay a kind of poll tax while standing in line to vote. And how do some politicians respond? Well, they're trying to make it a crime to give people water and a snack as they wait in lines that are obviously being made longer by their draconian actions. Think about that. Think about that. They are the ones making the lines longer. Through these draconian actions. And then they want to make it a crime to bring grandma some water while she's waiting in a line that they're making longer. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake. This is democracy in reverse. Rather than voters being able to pick the politicians, the politicians are trying to cherry pick their voters. I say this cannot stand. And so I rise, Mr. President, because that sacred and noble idea, one person, one vote, is being threatened right now. Politicians in my home state and all across America in their craven lust for power have launched a full-fledged assault on voting rights. They are focused on winning at any cost, even the cost of the democracy itself. And I submit that it is the job of each citizen to stand up for the voting rights of every citizen. And it is the job of this body to do all that it can to defend the viability of our democracy. That's why I am a proud co-sponsor of the For the People Act, which we introduced today. The For the People Act is a major step in the march toward our democratic ideals making it easier, not harder, for eligible Americans to vote by instituting common-sense pro-democracy reform. All right, pause right there, Jalen. I know we have to go to break. And back it up about 20, 30 seconds. Well, okay, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. We'll talk about more about what happened with Henrietta Wood, who sued for reparations in 1870. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. Stand by, everybody. Share this broadcast. Glad your friends are tuning in. How's everybody doing? Uh, okay, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Let's see here. All 
All right, let's see who we have here. Uh, stand by. Okay, we got Annie, Eric, Eric, TJ. Majahid. All right, everybody stand by. Um, we'll be back from breaking a couple minutes here. We gotta get ready for this next segment. You don't print the stuff. Okay, I print it. Okay. Oh, y'all can still register for the, I forgot to tell you, you can still register for the online course that I teach also, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We'll post the information here. This class is Tuesday, March 23rd. It's uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. All right. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. I always, it always tickles me when I hear that disclaimer. <laughs> They're saying, look, we don't know what the hell he's saying. He just sounds good when he's saying it. We don't, we don't, we don't have nothing to do with that. All right. so. All right, uh, 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment, um, I forgot to say at the beginning of the show, uh, you can still register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a eight-week, 16-hour online course that I teach. Um, I teach it online. We do with thousands of years of history. We deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place and uh, deal with a lot of history of the transatlantic slave trade to get a better understanding of it. Uh, I teach it Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do it live. You can ask questions through the uh, text chat. Uh, you can ask questions live. All the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded because people send me messages each week and say, I can't make it live to the class. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over and over again. You can watch from around the world. That's fine. I just posted the link here. You can also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com uh, to sign up. And the class is regularly, um, regularly $130 is on sale. Uh, $80. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. So if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and uh, right on the home page, uh, you scroll down, you'll see information for the radio show. We're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You click right here. You can listen to audio podcasts of our shows. We have about a 1,000 audio podcasts going back to 2010. You click here, you can read articles that I write, and there's information here about the online class, okay? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Click right here to register here. It takes you to the next page, okay? It talks about the class, and just click here to enroll. As soon as you're enrolled, you can start watching the content. You can watch from around the world. You can watch over and over again. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our guest speaker in the class was Dr. David M. Hotel. Who wrote the book the first americans were africans documented evidence he wrote this book the first americans were africans documented evidence that deals with the african presence in the americas going back tens of thousands of years ago even before native americans came into existence and then the week before that our guest speaker was a uh, cultural anthropologist sister nubia wartford okay we dealt with uh the origins of ancient kush and African queens of antiquity. Okay, this this time around teaching the class, because uh, this is the first time I've taught the class since 2019. This time around, I think we had to do nine sessions because I had um, I had two uh, guest speakers, so that's going to prolong things. But it's a fantastic class. We I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, 
We do a thousand years of history. You're going to learn a ton. OK. All right. So you can register for that. OK, let's uh, go back to this uh, story here of Henrietta Wood. And I was tying in this tying this into the voter suppression that we're seeing take place amongst Republicans in 43 state legislatures. OK, so right before the break, uh, I was sharing an excerpt. From uh, Georgia. U.S. Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock in his first Senate address that took place um, this past week. And uh, Georgia, Rev, Georgia's Reverend, Reverend Raphael Warnock told uh, his U.S. Senate colleagues Wednesday, uh, so this took place this past Wednesday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Go back and watch the broadcast I did for St. Patrick's Day. Oh, we got to some history. Yeah, I think some people were mad because I said St. Patrick was a mass murderer. He was. He was a mass murderer on behalf of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. Maybe I should have said, I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness before I said St. Patrick was a mass murderer, but yeah, he was. Okay. <laughs> we thought the we just thought to celebrate people. We don't know what they did. We just thought to celebrate people. We had no clue what we're celebrating. And when you study history, you know, often okay. You see, this is why they had that disclaimer <laughs> for my sh- <laughs> for my show, this is what I had a disclaimer. Oftentimes, Europeans honor their mass murderers. Okay, you know, it's it's like, hey, it's Columbus. I mean, it's oftentimes this is why they had a disclaimer. Oftentimes, Europeans honor their mass murderers. You know, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know, <laughs> but it's true. Okay, so. uh um, yeah, go back and watch the go back and watch the broadcast from March 17th. You can watch it at um the African History Network, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, and also 9 10 a.m. their Facebook page, 9 10 a.m. WFDF Superstation, their Facebook page. They broadcast it there. I think they broadcast it. They, they didn't take it down. So <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh let's get to so I, I want to go back to this clip to Reverend Raphael Warnock. And he's talking about the attempt to uh, suppress the votes of people in Georgia, especially African Americans, Hispanics, younger people, et cetera. Let's go back to this clip, Jalen. The of our democracy. That's why I am a proud co sponsor of the For the People Act which we introduced today. The For the People Act is a major step in the march toward our democratic ideals, making it easier, not harder, for eligible Americans to vote by instituting common-sense pro-democracy reforms, like establishing national automatic voter registration for every eligible citizen allowing all Americans to register to vote online and on election day, requiring states to offer at least two weeks of early voting, including weekends in federal elections, keeping souls to the polls programs alive, prohibiting states from restricting a person's ability to vote absentee or by mail, and preventing states from purging the voter rolls based solely on unreliable evidence like someone's voting history. something we've seen in Georgia and other states in recent years. And it would end the dominance of big money in our politics and ensure our public servants are there serving the public. Amidst these voter suppression laws and tactics, including partisan and racial gerrymandering, and then a system awash in dark money and the dominance of corporatist interests and politicians who do their bidding the voices of the American people have been increasingly drowned out and crowded out and squeezed out of their own democracy we must pass for the people so that the people might have a voice 
Your vote is your voice, and your voice is your human dignity. But not only that, we must have the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. You know, voting rights used to be a bipartisan issue. The last time the voting rights bill was reauthorized was 2006. George W. Bush was president. And it passed this chamber 98 to zero. And then in 2013, the Supreme Court rejected the successful formula for supervision and preclearance contained in the 1965 Voting Rights Act. They asked Congress to fix it. That was nearly eight years ago. And the American people are still waiting. Trips of protection, voters in states with a long history of voter discrimination, and voters in many other states have been thrown to the wind. We Americans have noisy and spirited debates about many things, and we should. That's what it means to live in a free country. But access to the ballot ought to be nonpartisan. I submit that there should be 100 votes in this chamber for policies that will make it easier for Americans to make their voices heard in our democracy. Surely, there ought to be at least 60 in this chamber who believe, as I do, that the four most powerful words uttered in a democracy are the people have spoken. Therefore, we must ensure that all of the people can speak. But if not, we must still pass voting rights. The right to vote is preservative of all other rights. It is not just another issue alongside other issues. It is foundational. It is the reason why any of us has the privilege of standing here in the first place. It is about the covenant we have with one another as an American people. He pulled us in and out of many one. It above all else must be protected. So let's be clear. I'm not here today to spiral into the procedural argument regarding whether the filibuster in general has merit or has outlived its usefulness. I'm here to say that this issue is bigger than the filibuster. I stand before you saying that this issue, access to voting and preempting politicians' efforts to restrict voting, is so fundamental to our democracy that it is too important to be held hostage by a Senate rule, especially one historically used to restrict the expansion of voting rights. It is a contradiction to say we must protect minority rights in the Senate while refusing to protect minority rights in the society. Well, the one Senate rule should overrule the integrity of our democracy. We must find a way to pass voting rights, whether we get rid of the filibuster or not. Hey, pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there and back, back it up about uh, 60 seconds or so. Okay, so that's Reverend Raphael Warnock. We're going to go back to Henrietta Wood in just a minute here, and we'll go to the phone lines also. Um, read this article from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We talked about it on Friday's show. This is from March 17th, 2021. Warnock, in first floor speech, champions federal voting laws to blunt Georgia's proposed restrictions. Now, in the article, they talk about the um, For the People Act. Uh, early, so let's see. Let's back up here. Um, it is a contradiction to say that we must protect minority rights in the Senate while refusing to protect minority rights in our society. Now, early, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock said, now, earlier this month, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives approved 
uh, approved election legislation known as the For the People Act. The For the People Act. It is unclear how, however, whether there are enough Senate Republicans willing to support the measure to overcome a potential filibuster because you need you're going to need 60 votes. You don't have 10. I don't think you have 10 Republicans that are going to vote for this. Under current rules, at least 10 GOP senators, 10 Republicans will have to vote with Democrats to proceed to a final vote. The timing of Warnock's maiden speech coincides with the introduction in the U.S. Senate of that legislation, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer assigned the measure as S-1, saying he wanted to indicate its importance by giving it his first bill number. Schumer said he also plans to lean on Warnock for help making the case for why the this bill should become law. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll play some more Warnock here in, in, in just a minute here. Let me, uh, uh, let me jump back to Henrietta Wood for just a minute here before we run out of time. Now, um, so the, the civil war began, uh, uh, the civil war began followed, uh, in 1863 by the, uh, emancipation proclamation, but, uh, Henrietta Wood's ordeal continued on, uh, July 1st, 1863, just days before the U S army just days before the U.S. Army arrived to free thousands of people around Natchez, Mississippi, um, Brandon determined to defy emancipation, forced some 300 uh, enslaved Africans to march 400 miles to Texas, far beyond the reach of federal soldiers, okay, Union soldiers. Henrietta Wood was among those uh, Africans who were forced to uh, march uh, 400 miles, okay, to get away from Union soldiers. Now, Brandon kept her enslaved on the cotton plantation until well after the Civil War ended. Once again, you were you were too lazy to do the work yourself, so you're gonna you're gonna keep them enslaved well after the Civil War ends and after slavery ends, okay? So see, this is. So when, when I hear, and then see the descendants of some of these very people like Senator Lindsey Graham, and we talked about this last week, how Lindsey Graham is upset that out of the $1.9 trillion American rescue plan that not a single Republican in the House or the Senate voted for, you have $5 billion, $10.4 billion going to farmers, $5 billion going to African American farmers to address almost a century of racism and discrimination against African-American farmers. And Lindsey Graham and other Republicans are crying about it. I just, I just find that very interesting. Now, you don't want to talk about the almost century of, of African-American farmers being locked out of government loans and the discrimination against African-American farmers from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You don't want to, you don't want to deal with that. You want to attack the remedy, but you don't want to talk about why the remedy was necessary. That's just disingenuous. That's just disingenuous. You, you look at this article here from Fox News. We, we, we talked about this last week. Farmers react to billions in COVID-19 relief bill for black farmers. These are white farmers. It should say white farmers react to billions in COVID-19 relief, relief bill. Where did common sense go? And then John Wesley Boyd Jr., President of the Black Farmers uh, Union is demanding an apology from uh, spineless Lindsey Graham. Uh, we talked about this as well. So check out the, uh, I forgot which broadcast that was last week. Uh, check this out. Rightfully so. Spineless Lindsey Graham goes on Fox News and, and basically talks about uh, how unfair this bill is, but he doesn't talk about almost 100 years and, and the fact that African-American farmers have lost 92% of their land, okay, and the re and why they lost almost ninety two percent of the land. He doesn't want to deal with any of the calls. He he just wants to attack the remedy. Remedy. A uh, black farmer, Lindsey Graham, must apologize for racist comment about subsidies kept from farmers of color for years. All right. 
Okay, so let's go back to uh, Henrietta Wood here. Just a second, let me bring this back up from Smithsonian Mag. Okay, name of this article from uh, Smithsonian Mag, official website of the Smithsonian Institute. In 1870, Henrietta Wood sued for reparations and won. In 1870, Henrietta Wood sued for reparations and won. Now, there are no known pictures, surviving pictures of Henrietta Wood also, just so people know. Okay, so, um, so Brandon kept Henrietta Wood enslaved on a cotton plantation until well after the Civil War ended, even Juneteenth, the day in June 1865, when Union soldiers arrived in Texas to enforce uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, he did not liberate Henrietta Wood. And some, you had some uh, uh, slave owners that did not, who, who kept the information away from them about uh, General Order Number 3 and the Emancipation Proclamation, even after it was delivered on June 19, uh, 1865, okay? So you're going to have some that have kept slaves going into 1866. Once, once again, you know, I was like, you too lazy to do the work yourself. This is what I understand, you know. Um, okay, we're coming up on the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on the Anton AM Superstation Future Radio. When we come back, we'll go to the phone lines. 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. We'll be back in just a minute here. Stand by, everybody. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right. We're back in uh, three minutes, I think it is. We'll also talk about uh, the Selma to Montgomery March. This is the 56th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. We'll talk about that as well. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, March 21st, 2021. Spring is officially here. Uh, the vernal equinox came uh, Saturday, March 20th. So we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we were talking about uh, the story of Henrietta Wood, uh, who sued for Reparate, former slaves sued for reparations in 1870. We were also talking about the floor speech that uh, U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock, Reverend Raphael Warnock from Georgia, gave on Wednesday, March 17th, uh, talking about the voter restriction laws that the Georgia State Legislature is trying to push, Republicans in the Georgia State Legislature are trying to push. Okay, uh, so. Even we go back to this article from Smithsonian Mag from uh, dealing with hearing at the wood. Even Juneteenth, the day in June 1865, when Union soldiers arrived in Texas 
to enforce an em emancipation did not liberate Henrietta Wood. It wasn't until she returned to Mississippi with Brandon in 1866 that she gained her freedom. She continued to work for Brandon, now promised a salary of $10 a month, but she would say she was never paid. Imagine that. Okay, I didn't think he was going to pay her anyway. Uh, it was four years after the Confederate surrender before Henrietta Wood was able to re return up the river where she tried to locate long lost members of her family in Kentucky. Whether she succeeded uh, in that quest is unknown, but she did find a lawyer. His name was Harvey Myers. Harvey Myers. Harvey Myers uh, helped Henrietta Wood file a lawsuit in Cincinnati against Zebulon Ward, who was now a wealthy man living in Lex Lexington, Kentucky. The post-war constitutional amendments that abolished slavery and extended national citizenship to ex-slaves, um, 14th Amendment, 1868, enabled Henrietta Wood to pursue Zebulon Ward in federal court. You have the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which gave African Americans, especially African American men, uh, rights of white men and, and to be able to enter into contracts. That's the Civil Rights Act of 1866. That laid the foundation for the 14th Amendment of 1868. Now, uh, the post war constitutional amendments that abolished slavery and extended national citizenship to ex slaves enabled Wood to pursue Zebulon Ward in federal court. Ward's lawyers stalled claiming that her failed antebellum lawsuit for freedom proved his innocence. They also said that Zebulon Ward's alleged crimes had occurred too far in the past, a recurring argument against reparations. Now, Henrietta Wood suffered another unexpected setback in 1874 when her lawyer was murdered by a client's husband in an unrelated uh, divorce case. Then in 1878, jurors ruled that uh, Zebulon Ward should pay Henrietta Wood for her enslavement, for her enslavement. A record now at the National Archives in Chicago confirms that he did pay in 1879. OK, let's go to the phone lines. Uh, let's go to Joe line one. Joe, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Uh, tell us where you're calling from. Hey, family. I'm calling from Norfolk, Virginia. For, from where? Yeah, yeah. Um, Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk, Virginia. Okay, this is Joe. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, bro, first I want to let you know, man, we love you for not only what you do, but who you are, bro. You know oh, thank you, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, yes. Hey, um, I got a couple of questions. Go ahead. Um, the first one, you know, I'm not I'm not really sure the source. That's why I gotta I gotta come to the source. You understand? Okay. Um it's like the, the last eighty years of slavery when um it was abolished to bring slaves into the country. You said the last eighty before, years? Before that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, um, eighteen oh eight. Eighteen oh eight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before that eighty year period, um were they just primarily bringing in men? Or were they bringing in men and women? Well, well, I know during that eighty-year period, the birth, uh, with the uh, the breeding plantations just kind of sparked up after that. Okay, your voice is a little muffled. Are you on a speakerphone? I was. So I, 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 I took it off the speaker. Okay. Um, okay. Now you now say I'm, first. I'm first, up. first of all, you say it lasts eighty years. Yeah. Okay. Now the. International transatlantic slave trade was abolished by the U.S. Congress. They passed the bill March 2nd, 1807, and then it goes into effect January 1st, 1808. So from 1808 to 1860, the last known slave ship is the Clotilda, which comes into Alabama about June 1860. So all the Africans that were brought in from January 1st, 1808, through 1860, all that was illegal based upon federal law. All that's human trafficking, all that's right. illegal based upon federal law. Uh, you're going to have, I got to look at the actual numbers. You're going to have, now you're going to have uh, African 
warriors who are captured who are primarily men you're going to have you're going to have women uh also captured in raids you're going to have african men and women in raids but a lot of them uh it, now it also you see it also depends upon um uh, it, it it also depend upon uh which state they're going into and for what purpose what type of plantation as well that they're needed for also so um but a lot of them are going to be you know captured in uh raids on villages and things like that after from from 1860 to um from 18 from 1808 to 1860 i need to like look at some specific numbers on that why why'd you ask I was, I was just I was just curious because um I I, I can't remember the source mm -hmm. but I remember um them, them saying something like you know um the slavery before that before that period before they started importing a lot of women was primarily like a death sentence for men you know what I'm saying and they were working to death they were they were living past we pretty much past the age of thirty yeah it's also, so it see it also depends upon the type of plantation they're on. And the other thing, the other thing is important to understand is that um, all um, African slaves did not live on "quote unquote" plantations because they had many of them had skilled trades. Many of them were skilled tradesmen right. as well. So it depends upon uh, it depends upon the region they were in and the type of plantation they were they were on, which also determined the. The type of labor they did, the type of work they did, and how treacherous it was. Um, okay. and, and one of the things is going to happen. So you know, so, it's, so a, a lot of this is not like a um, a um, a blanket, a general statement. It, it depends upon the region that you're talking about and the type of work they did. Um, cotton picking cotton was was um, very laborious work. Uh, so you know it, it 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 depends like what you're talking about now working in like uh sawmills was very dangerous work also one of the things that would happen yeah. is that you would have uh insurance companies that gave that took out insurance policies or sold insurance policies on enslaved africans on the plantations or that were owned by you know the slave owners not just those who worked on plantations but also those who worked in various factories sawmills different right. things like that because that was that, because that was very dangerous work also so if they uh so if the, if the slave was killed or died on the job or whatever you know the, the slave died untimely they would cash in the insurance policy and go buy another one uh one of the one of the most famous uh insurance companies that sold policies on uh, enslaved Africans was known as the Nautilus Life Insurance Company. They were founded in the spring of 1845 in Massachusetts, if I remember correctly, in that area. And then they changed the name to the New York Life Insurance Company. Now, to their credit, they've been okay. upfront with their history. For three years, they sold insurance policies on enslaved Africans. They've been one of the ones that have been more upfront with that history, but there were about 40 U.S. based insurance companies that sold uh, policies on slavery. Go ahead with your next question. Okay, uh, my next question is it's about um, it's, okay, like yeah, excuse me, but I'm a little nervous talking to you. But anyway, that's all right, man. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, looks like Black Wall Street was uh, burned. Black Wall Street was burned in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, Black Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, 1921, um, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Um, it, it's, just my, it's my understanding that there was like 1,800 other prospering um, black communities that were burned in a similar situation. Mm, but, uh, nah, I don't know about that. There were, other, there were other prosperous towns. Some of them were destroyed. Some of them, you know, people are going to move away from or expressways come through eventually in the 50s and 60s yeah. things like that uh now 18 1800 prosperous black towns burned down i i i need to look at that information i, I don't know about that well, see, I, the, the level, like i said i, I don't remember the source of just, i just remember the information that's why i was 
I'm calling yeah. you know, to Yeah, you have please. you have a tax like uh, on uh 1923 uh Rosewood, Florida. Rosewood, Florida, you have a tax and, and Rosewood in that case, so, so people remember, remember the movie Rosewood uh directed by uh John Singleton. When you study that, mm -hmm. there's about 200 people that lived in that town. There's a little town, Rosewood, Florida. And it's predominantly African American, except except for one white family. Everybody else is African American. That when when right. they destroy Rosewood, they remove Rosewood, Florida from the map. That's how badly they destroyed. They right. remove they remove they remove Rosewood from the map. All the African Americans flee, left their land behind, and white people took over their land. Okay, uh, but eighteen hundred towns burned down. I, I don't I don't know about that. I need to see some would sources for that. To track that with the, um, would, would there be a way to, to track that with the interstate uh, that, was, that was built where those towns were? The highway. Now, I know you had uh, expressways that ran through about 1,600 African-American communities. Okay, I know that. Okay. Um, when you read the book, How White Folks Got So Rich, the untold story of American white supremacy. They talk about that, but see that that's in the that's in the 1950s and 60s. That's the U.S. Interstate Highway Act in 1952 and 56. Okay, that's different okay. than the towns okay. being burned down. Okay, okay, that, that, that might be the number I'm looking for. There. Okay, and, and which, what's the name of that book? How white folks got so rich. Well, I see it now. Yeah, the untold story of American yeah. white supremacy. This is the third edition I'm holding up. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, um, I, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, sir. All right, Joe. Thanks for calling. Keep listening. All right. Uh, All right three, okay, thanks. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a quick question or comment. 313-778-7600. Then we're here. To keep in mind, we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also, so you can call during the week as well. Um. Okay, let's shift gears here. So. Read the uh, read the information dealing with Henrietta Wood, okay? Uh, and it's a fascinating article here from uh, SmithsonianMag.com. In 1870, Henrietta Wood sued for reparations and won the $2,500 verdict, the largest ever of its kind, offers evidence of the generational impact such awards can have. Now, this article is by uh, W. Caleb McDaniel. Uh, and it is from September 2019. Okay. There was also a, another article from the Washington Post. And I printed this up. Now I have a larger font. I printed this, page, this article up. This article is 22 pages, tore up my printer cartridge. Okay. <laughs> but this is an article. Um, she, sued, she sued her enslaver for reparations and one, her descendants never knew. This is from February 21st, uh, so February 24th, 2021. This is a newer article, okay, dealing with uh, Henrietta Wood also. Uh, so this would be an interesting movie. I'm not a fan of slave movies or movies about slavery, but this would be an a interesting movie uh, to, uh, this would be an interesting movie to make, you know, I want I want I want to see a movie where <laughs> the slave beats the hell out of the slave master and you know I I want to see that movie you know <laughs> that would be a happy ending for me for like a slave movie <laughs> You see where they had the disclaimer right <laughs> That would be a happy ending for me <laughs> But anyway uh read this article here for uh from uh Washington Post also. This is a more recent article. She sued her enslaver for reparations and won. Her descendants never knew. After the Civil War, Henrietta Wood made history by pursuing an audacious lawsuit against the man who'd kidnapped her back into slavery, yet the story was lost to her own family. The story was lost to her own family. Here's a picture of uh, uh, David Blackman, one of, uh, one of her lives. Okay, so check this out also. All right, uh, I, I want to go back to uh, another clip here. This is Reverend Raphael Warnock on the U.S. Senate floor. 
from the great state of Georgia, former Confederate state. And he's talking about the voter suppression that Republicans in the Georgia state legislature are uh, pushing through. And they're upset with the election results of the 2020 presidential election and the uh, runoff elections, the Senate elections, et cetera, the U.S. Senate elections in Georgia also. Okay, let's go back to this clip, uh, Jalen. So let's be clear. I'm not here today to spiral into the procedural argument regarding whether the filibuster in general has merit or has outlived its usefulness. I'm here to say that this issue is bigger than the filibuster. I stand before you saying that this issue, access to voting and preempting politicians' efforts to restrict voting, is so fundamental to our democracy that it is too important to be held hostage by a Senate rule, especially one historically used to restrict the expansion of voting rights. It is a contradiction to say we must protect minority rights in the Senate while refusing to protect minority rights in the society. Now, the old Senate rule should overrule the integrity of our democracy. We must find a way to pass voting rights whether we get rid of the filibuster or not. And so as I close, and nobody believes a preacher when he says as I close. <laughs> Let me say that I, as a man of faith, I believe that democracy is the political enactment of a spiritual idea. The sacred work of all human beings. The notion that we all have within us a spark of the divine and a right to participate in the shaping of our destiny. Reinhold Niebuhr was right. Humanity's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but humanity's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. John Lewis understood that, was beaten on a bridge defending it. Amelia Boynton, like so many women, not mentioned this clearly enough, was gassed on that same bridge. A white woman named Viola Luiso was killed. Mega Evans was murdered in his own driveway. Florida Cheney and Goodman, two Jews and an African American standing up for that sacred idea of democracy, also paid the ultimate price. And we in this body would be stopped and stymied by partisan politics. Short-term political gain? Senate procedure? I say let's get this done no matter what. I urge my colleagues to pass these two bills, strengthen and limpen the cords of our democracy, secure our credibility as the premier voice for freedom-loving people and democratic movements all over the world. And win the future for all of our children. Mr. President, I yield the floor. All right, let's pause it right there. Okay, so check out the uh, article here from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. It has the uh, full video there. Warnock, in his first floor speech, champions federal voting laws to blunt Georgia's proposed restrictions, okay? Now, there's a uh, article from uh, Associated Press. Uh, we'll talk about this probably on a Monday show because we run out of time here. Um, here's another Raphael, Raphael Ted Cruz. Um, all an all hands move moment, an all hands moment. GOP rallies behind 
voting limits. See, this is something that Reverend Raphael Warnock is talking about. Okay, uh, and on an on an invitation only call last week. Now, this is from March nineteenth, twenty twenty one. On an invitation only call last week, Senator Raphael Ted Cruz, who acts like he's white, uh, huddled with Republican state lawmakers to call them to battle on the issue of voting rights. He's not trying to. I thought I thought he would be trying to battle coronavirus. He's trying to battle against voting rights. Democrats are trying to expand voting rights to quote unquote illegal aliens and child molesters. Uh, he said. And Republicans must do all they can to stop them. If they push through far reaching election legislation now before the Senate, the GOP won't win elections again for generations. Oh, that's what it is. You're afraid that if more people vote, they're going to vote your ignorant ass out of office. That's what that's, that's what this boils down to. If they push through far reaching legislation now before the Senate, the GOP won't win elections again for reparations for uh, generations. Asked if there was room to compromise, Senator Rafael Ted Cruz, lion flying Ted Cruz, who went to Cancun while Texas was in disarray, he said no. HR 1's only objective, this is lion flying Ted Cruz, he said HR 1's only objective is to ensure that Democrats can never again lose another election that they will win and maintain control of the House of Representatives and the Senate and of the state legislatures for the next century, lion flying Rafael Ted Cruz said. He told this to a group organized by ALEC. ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Research ALEC. ALEC was founded by Paul Weyrich in 1973. And Paul Rayrick said it's in their best interest to have fewer people voting than more people voting. Now, he said he told this to a group organized by ALEC, American Legislative Exchange Council, a corporate backed conservative group that provides model legislation to state legislators. We'll talk about this tomorrow. This is Lion Flying Ted Cruz. OK. These are the type of people who must be voted out of office, period. There's no exceptions. Got to go, got to go. Read this article from Associated Press. We'll deal with this. Uh, we'll talk about this either Monday or Tuesday. An all-hands moment, GOP rallies behind voting limits. Instead of them trying to appeal to African Americans and Hispanics with better policies and Asian Americans, they want to restrict who can vote. All right. Okay, so uh, let's switch gears here. Speaking of voting, today is the 56th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery. The march from Selma to Montgomery. Now, we many people have seen the the movie Selma, um, starring David Aiello as uh, Dr. King, and we know that earlier this month. We commemorated the 56th anniversary of uh, Bloody Sunday, March 7th, uh, 1965. Now, in the name of, uh, I'm going to look at this article here from um, uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel. And uh, this is from this day in history. I get the emails every morning about 6 a.m. from history.com dealing with um, this day in history. In the name of African-American voting rights, 3,200 civil rights uh, demonstrators in Alabama, led by the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we'll pull this article up here for you to see also. Just a second here. I have a good picture. So we're commemorating the 56th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, which in, in their fighting for the Voting Rights Act of 1965, at the same time, Republicans are trying to put voter restrictions, pass voter restriction bills in the state legislature to limit who can vote. What do you think they're afraid of? 
What do you think Republicans are afraid of? So in the name of African Americans voting rights, 3,200 civil rights demonstrators in Alabama led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who pastored the Ebenezer, who, who, who or preached at Ebenezer Baptist Church and that's the church that Reverend Raphael Warnock is the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. They began a historic march from Selma to Montgomery. Montgomery is the capital of Alabama. Federalized Alabama National Guardsmen and FBI agents were on hand to provide safe passage for the march, which twice had uh, been turned back by Alabama State Police at Selma's Edmund Pettus Bridge. In 1965, Dr. King and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided to make the small town of Selma, Alabama, the focus of their drive to win voting rights for African Americans in the South. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, was a vocal opponent of the African American Civil Rights Movement, and local authorities in Selma, Alabama, had consistently thwarted efforts by the Dallas County Voters League and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, to register local African American citizens. Although George Wallace promised to prevent it from going forward, on March 7th, uh, 1965, also known as Bloody Sunday, on March 7th, some 600 demonstrators led by SCLC leader Hosea Williams and SNCC leader John Lewis, and, and, and John Lewis was the only one from SNCC there, because the other members of SNCC, they decided not to go. They began the 54-mile march to the state capitol. After crossing, Edmund, after crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were met by Alabama state troopers and posse men who attacked them with nightsticks, tear gas, and whips after they refused to turn back. Several of the protesters were severely beaten and others ran for their lives. The incident was captured on national television and outraged many Americans. Dr. King, who was in Atlanta at the time, because he wasn't there for Bloody Sunday, okay, he was in Atlanta at the time, promised to return to Selma, Alabama immediately and lead another attempt. On March 9th, 1965, Dr. King led another marching attempt, but turned the marchers around when state troopers again blocked the road. On March 21st, 1965, U.S. Army troops and federalized Alabama National Guardsmen escorted the marchers across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and down Highway 80 when the highway narrowed to two lanes, only 300 marchers were permitted. But thousands more rejoined the Alabama Freedom March as it came into Montgomery, Alabama, the state capital, on March 25th. On the, state, on the steps of the Alabama state capital, Dr. King addressed live television cameras and a crowd of 25,000 just a few hundred feet from the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where he got his start as a minister in 1954. Okay, so you can read more about this here at um, history.com. Martin Luther King Jr. begins the march from Selma to Montgomery, March 21st, 1965. Today is the 56th anniversary of the beginning of the march from Selma to Montgomery. Now, um, they mentioned Viola Louisa. Viola Louisa was a uh, white uh, housewife from Detroit who saw Bloody Sunday on her TV at home. On March 25, 1965, Viola, Lu Viola Louisa, a middle-class white housewife from Detroit, Michigan, was shot and killed in, Loud uh, in Loudonsboro, Alabama. After watching television footage of Bloody Sunday, Viola Louisa drove to Selma, Alabama to join Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s efforts to organize another march. Hours after the successful Selma to Montgomery march ended, Viola Louisa and Leroy Moton, a 19-year-old uh, local African-American activist, were driving back to Montgomery, Alabama to pick up demonstrators waiting to return to Selma, Alabama. Four Klansmen chased down Viola Louisa's car and opened fire, killing her. Uh, Moton, Leroy Moton, survived by pretending to be dead, 
One of the drivers was an FBI informant who had participated in the 1961 beatings of Freedom Riders in Birmingham, Alabama. This FBI informant testified against the three other Klansmen who were with him on the night of Viola Louisa's murder. They, uh, they were acquitted by an all-white Lowndes County jury, but later convicted of federal civil rights violations, later convicted of federal civil rights violations. The events in Selma, Alabama galvanized public opinion and mobilized Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act, which President Lyndon Johnson signed into law on August 6, 1965. Today, the bridge that served as the backdrop to Bloody Sunday still bears the name of a white supremacist, but now it's a symbolic civil rights landmark. So there's an effort to change the name of the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, to the uh, name it after John Lewis. Okay, so I don't. Uh, da, da, da. So okay, Edmund Pettus was a former Confederate bri uh, brigadier uh, general, U.S. senator, and leader of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. So. Um, yeah, as of yet, let's see, renaming Edmund Pettus Bridge. As of yet, I don't think it's been renamed uh, uh, after John Lewis. There's an effort uh, to do that, but I don't think it's taking place yet. Okay. All right, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, when you do it through Cash App, be sure to type in dollar sign the AHN show, dollar sign the AHN show. It'll come up, it'll say Michael, it'll have my picture there also. Uh, you can also support us at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. Uh, all my DVD lectures there and digital downloads are there as well. Also, you can still register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'a for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So class meets uh, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As soon as you register, you can watch the previous classes. Uh, the, uh, the topic, uh, I didn't get a chance to get to the topic, Black Restaurants That Fed the Civil Rights Movement. We'll talk about that on Monday show. Okay. Uh, we're out of time here. Remember, right now it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Stay tuned for, uh, I think it's the best of Reverend Al Sharpton no or Democracy Now or something. Stay tuned for it, and we'll talk to you Monday. Peace. All right. All right, everybody. Take care. We got to go. Talk to y'all later. Peace.